The next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer, giving you the opportunity to utilize the privacy of your priesthood in order to be in fellowship with God. And I do this at every message because of the importance of this standard operating procedure. There are standard operating procedures in the military, and in fact there's a procedure to everything in life, and this does not exclude the spiritual life. There is a procedure, and therefore without 1 John 1, 9, we would always be out of fellowship and in carnality and unable to learn these things of the Word of God. <coughs> therefore, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer so that you might uh, name your sins to God, and then God the Holy Spirit, your teacher and your mentor, will bring to your memory those things that you have forgotten like those things last Sunday. Therefore, uh, let us uh, utilize 1 John 1, 9. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to study your word this morning. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us concentration so that we might come to understand these things of the word. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, we've been studying sin, and we went through the sequence of sin and other things related to sin, and now we're going to move on to the work on the cross regarding sin. The work on the cross regarding sin. And with imputed sin, we noted that in Adam we are all counted guilty. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15:22 and Romans 3:23. And yet in Christ we are found not guilty, and that's 1 Corinthians 15:22b and 2 Corinthians 5:21. There is inherent sin, and Jesus Christ died in reference to the old sin nature. He made provision for us to handle the old sin nature. That's found in 1 John 1:7. And He rejected human good, and we noted human good. If you give to a homeless person or a poor person, and you're outside of fellowship. That's wood, hay, and stubble, and you get nowhere with it. And that is as a believer. As an unbeliever, it does nothing for you, and you are, of course, still condemned to the lake of fire. And then we have personal sin, and Jesus Christ bore the sins of everyone. And, of course, as a believer, we have 1 John 1, 9, and we've been noting the importance of that ever since we studied Rebound a couple of weeks ago. And the penalty of sin is spiritual death, and this is replaced by the provision of spiritual life for anyone who believes in Jesus Christ. That's found in Romans 6, uh, 23 and Matthew 27, 46. Now we move on to the issue of sin. For the unbeliever, this is point one, for the unbeliever, the issue of sin is rejection of Christ as Savior. And that's found in John 3, 18 and John 3, 36. For the unbeliever, the issue of sin is rejection of Christ as Savior. John 3.18 and John 3.36. This is the basis of their condemnation at the last judgment. And the last judgment is found in Revelation. And the basis for uh, their condemnation will be on the basis of good, their good works. In fact, if you look at that verse in Revelation, it will say they are judged on the basis of works. That does not mean they are judged on the basis of they've been so good, now they're going to get into heaven. No, it means all of their good deeds add up to minus R. That means, minus R means minus righteousness. Their good deeds are as filthy rags as we noted in the last message. So, therefore, their good deeds are not good enough to satisfy God the Father who is perfect. And uh, if you wanted to satisfy God the, the Father, you'd have to be perfect. That's why Jesus Christ was perfect for us. And therefore, he died as a substitute for us. And that's why we have eternal uh, salvation and eternal security as well. So the penalty of sin is spiritual death. And therefore, let's uh, look at uh, point two. For the believer, now for the unbeliever, you have to believe in Christ. The issue is the sin of rejection of Christ. For the believer, the issue of sin is the utilization of the rebound technique, which we've been studying, and it's 1 John 1, 9. And you have to utilize 1 John 1, 9 to be in fellowship. Now, I didn't see any CDs. If anybody brought some, there's some over there. Hand those to me. We have some CDs now, and they got some new nifty covers on them. I like them. Well, then I get to play some white in there. Well, that's, that's fine. Well, well, there's some CDs over there with lessons one through eight, and uh, they teach 
the basic lessons one through eight and rebound and here it is and there's one they've made in color that looks a lot better but this is good and uh, if you want to listen to one through eight some of you weren't able to be here for some of them for sickness and other reasons and you can get it uh, on on the CD there it's actually mp3 and listen to it because we've studied rebound and every time I get to rebound I want to go back and uh, talk about David and what he did but I can't keep going back or I'd be uh, up here just uh, rewinding everything that's why we have to have midweek classes so that we can move on so if you don't understand some of the things I'm saying you can get it on the basic series one through eight and uh, therefore you'll have a greater understanding of these things and you won't be confused so for the believer, the issue of sin is the utilization of the rebound technique, 1 John 1, 9, that's point two. For the believer, the issue of sin is the utilization of 1 John 1, 9, which states if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Point three, in the New Testament, the word sins is in the plural, and this refers to personal sins in action, as in action, not in action, as in action. In the New Testament, the word sins in the plural refers to personal sins as an action. The word sin in the singular refers to the old sin nature, and that's uh, Romans 5.13 is an exception because there it's referring to the principle of sin. So in the New Testament, the word sins in the plural refers to personal sins as an action. It's not talking about the old sin nature. That's not an action. The old sin nature is simply part of us, and all of us right now have within us an old sin nature, and hopefully it's not active, and we are filled with God the Holy Spirit through utilization of 1 John 1, 9. Now we're going to take a look at the origin of sin. Point one, God is not the author or of sin or temptation. I heard uh, somebody told me once, they said, uh, God is tempting me. God doesn't tempt anyone. He tests you. He doesn't tempt you. God is not the author of temptation. Now, you are tempted from the source of your sin nature from, that's in your body. And if you're uh, an extremely mature believer, and if you go through evidence testing, Satan himself will tempt you. And that happened in the case of Job, and it happened in the case of Jesus Christ, of course, through the temptations in uh, Matthew. And we note these things, and if you, uh, now, if you're a baby believer, Satan is not after you. Satan doesn't care about you. That's why in the Bible it says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? In other words, I don't know you. So, uh, uh, Satan only messes with those people who are uh, moving way up in the uh, spiritual life and go through evidence testing and we'll note this later when we get to the advanced spiritual life. So in the New Testament, the word sins is in the plural and refers to personal sins as an action. Now we went to the origin of sin, that God is not the author of sin or temptation, and that's found in James 1, 13 through 15. God is not the author of sin or temptation, and that's found in James 1, verse 13 through 15. <clears throat> Point two. Sin originated with Satan through negative volition. Actually, Satan became arrogant. He said, I will be like the Most High God. And that is where sin originated with Satan. And then uh, as a result of that, we have the angelic <coughs> conflict, which we have not studied yet, but we will study the angelic conflict in detail uh, probably after we study sin or uh, after we study a few other things, and then we'll get to that. So if you don't know what the angelic conflict is, don't worry, we'll get to it. But just know that as a result of the angelic conflict, God created Adam and Eve. And he created Adam and the woman in perfection. And this is something to note. Adam and the woman in perfection, their marriage actually failed in perfection. And um, marriage is a very uh, sticky issue. And one day we'll have a subject uh, study on marriage. And I was telling my dad, uh, we were talking about the numbers in the church, not that it bothers me, but we were just talking about it, and I said, do you know what? And we put a sign outside, we're studying marriage every day, and I bet this place will fill up in a hurry. But that's not, uh, that's not the way it's going to work. We're going to have a system here. And then uh, when I teach other subjects, uh, such as arrogance, well, we might get down to two or three people. So that's just the way it works. And uh, if you come in just for marriage, well, your marriage is going to fail because uh, 
Uh, the, the, the Word of God is what makes a marriage work, but I'm getting off subject here. So, God created Adam and the woman in perfection. Both were free moral agents, and just as Satan was. In other words, they had free volition. They could choose what they wanted to do, and that's the way God operates. God operates on the fact that we have freedom, and we live in a free country, and that's a wonderful thing, and all of us here today have freedom. We can choose to listen, or we can choose to play with our fingernails, or do whatever. So therefore, God created Adam and the woman in perfection. Both were free moral agents, just as Satan was, and they could only sin by negative volition acting independently of God. When God created Adam and the woman, they were perfect beings, and their point of reference with God was personal love. And then once they sinned, they came under the impersonal love of God, and but their point of reference with God was now God's eternal and perfect justice. Therefore, when they sinned, it switched to the justice of God, and therefore the justice of God condemned sin, and it was condemned at the cross. And all we have to do is believe in Christ for salvation, and all we have to do is name our sins when we sin, and that is a result of Jesus Christ work on the cross, not a result of our work. A lot of people think they can do some type of work, and it's foolishness. It's not a result of us. It's a result of what Christ did, and it's a point of humility. In fact, the first humble thing that you do as a believer is, is a name your sins to God, and you say, well, how is that humble? Because you admit you're wrong. You know, a lot of times in marriage, people go around and they... Uh, well, I'm right, and then the other person says they're right, and they get in a big fight, and they're both yelling at each other about how right they are. Well, the first act of humility in the Christian way of life is to say, I'm wrong, and that's what you do when you name your sins. You are actually naming something you have done wrong. You're accepting it. You're not justifying it. And we've studied self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption, and uh, we don't justify it. If we justify sin, that is an act of arrogance. You can say, well, that person deserved to be gossip about. Look at their pathetic self. Well, that's justification. You're in sin. You have to humble yourself, and that's a part of humility, and say, Father, I have gossiped. And that is the point that you are forgiven of that sin and all unknown sins, as per 1 John 1, 9. So God did not create, and this is uh, point four, God did not create Adam or the woman with an old sin nature. They acquired the old sin nature through negative volition. So what happened in the Garden of Eden? Well, Adam and Eve were there. First, Adam was, and an order was issued to Adam. God told Adam, he said, Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam understood this clearly. And then uh, the woman was uh, created out of Adam's rib. And when the woman was created, um, she went to Bible class with her husband every day. And that's a point to be made. In the cool of the evening, you'll find this in Genesis if you want to look it up. In the cool of the evening, every day, the Lord Jesus Christ came to them and taught them a Bible class. And it was every single day. Thus the importance of the Word of God in your life every day. Now what happened was, Adam and Eve would go to the garden in the cool of the evening, and the Lord Jesus Christ would actually come and teach them, since they did not have a Bible, as we do, and they do not have the materials we have. They had to have a different system. So Jesus Christ himself taught Adam and Eve. And what happened was, obviously, Eve was not listening in class. And uh, so Satan comes along. Now, Eve is not listening in Bible class. And Satan comes along, and why does Satan attack Eve first? Well, one of the sub-points is because she wasn't listening, but the main point is because Adam was in authority over the woman, and that's how God set it up. And Satan knew that if he went to the man first, and said, and, uh, Satan went to the man and said, eat of this fruit, and if the man ate of it, and then in spiritual death he would have seen the woman and said, you eat of the fruit. She was under Adam's authority, and she would have had to do so. Therefore, it would have been a mistrial, and uh, it would have been uh, Satan would have had to go straight to hell because uh, the the trial wouldn't have worked out that way. Because that if uh, if uh, I'm getting uh, confused here, not confused, but if uh, Adam is Adam is the authority, so if Adam 
uh, tells the woman to do it, she is not culpable. And if she is not culpable, therefore she uh, is not guilty of it and would uh, the trial would therefore be over. So in this case, Eve had not been listening to the Bible classes. And Satan comes to her and says, uh, by flattery, oh, what a beautiful place you have here, as if she had anything to do with it. But women love to uh, organize things and decorate. And so, oh, I do have such a beautiful place here, don't I? And so they're talking and they're having a conversation. And I don't know what Eve was doing modern day. I mean, Adam. I don't know what Adam was doing. Maybe in the modern day he's uh, watching a football game or something. But he was probably out naming the trees and looking at the animals. And here's Eve having conversation with Satan. And this shows there's a breakdown in the marriage as uh, Adam is not utilizing his authority. If Adam would have known this, he could have went straight to Eve and said, What are you doing talking to this, this creature, this creep? Uh, you know we are not to eat of the fruit, and therefore there would have been an end to that. But he didn't. He was busy doing his thing, and she was busy doing her thing, and there's nothing wrong with that in a marriage. If uh, both of you have your own hobbies and doing your own things, that's not the point. But the point is Adam was not utilizing his authority, and that's the point I'm trying to make. So Eve, and this is the same in marriages today, if a woman gets bored, uh, she likes a little flirtation. Now Satan wasn't flirting with her as such, but as a way of application, a woman loves conversation, loves to have conversation with people. And if a sneaky man understands that, he can uh, come around and have some really good conversation with a woman, and then the husband says, you know, I know this guy. I think he's a creep, and I think he's trying to get at you and uh, steal you from me. And then uh, the, then the uh, woman will say, well, no, we're just friends. Well, that was the case of Adam and of Eve, excuse me, and Satan. Satan was befriending Eve, and they were just friends as, so, as such. But Satan was using her, and that's what users do, as a lot of men are users, using women for sex. Well... Satan is using her so that he can win the appeal trial of the angelic conflict. So therefore, uh, what happens is Satan uh, tells her, Now I see that beautiful tree in the middle of the garden. Uh, I hear that you cannot eat of that tree. And then uh, Eve says, Yes, God says we cannot eat. And notice what she says if you're in Genesis. And she says, Yes, we cannot eat or touch it. Was what she's doing. She's adding to the scripture. Uh, what did the, well, there was no scripture then, but she's adding to the classes that she's been hearing, and Jesus Christ has clearly told both of them, do not eat from the tree. He said nothing about touching it, yet she's adding to it. This indicates she has not been listening in class. Therefore, she's susceptible to the flirtation of Satan. So what happens is she says, we cannot eat or touch it, and then Satan makes it very clear he says, uh, well, why don't you eat of the tree? He wants to make sure she eats it. Now, Eve believes that death, that, her, uh, that death lie in the property of the tree. In other words, she believes that if she goes up and touches the tree, she'll drop dead. But that's not the case. She hasn't been listening in class. Adam knows better. Adam knows that, this, that it's an issue of volition. What's volition? You can choose yes or no. That's simply what volition is. So Adam could choose yes or no. Will I eat of the tree? Yes or no. And he knew that was the case. It was part of his volition. So Adam, from this point, was saying, no, I will not eat of the tree. And then Eve is being seduced by Satan, and Satan uh, tells her to eat of the tree. And so she does, because she's been flattered half to death. So she goes to the tree, and she eats of the tree. Now she touches it, and nothing happens. So she hasn't been listening. She says, well, I'm holding this beautiful fruit, and I'm all right. Maybe Satan's right. Maybe I will be as wise as God in this. And there's another point about that. Eve wanted to have the wisdom of God. And do you know why? Because if she had the wisdom of God, she would be smarter than her husband. Now, she wasn't in the creation smarter than her husband. But if she ate of the fruit, so she thought she would be smarter than their husband. And this is a point of contention because a lot of ladies are in competition with their husbands. Uh, they, they want to uh, outdo them in some way, and it's a problem for some, not, not everybody. I'm not making a, a general statement, but it 
can be a problem that women get in competition with their husbands. So she wanted to be smarter than Adam, and she knew, well, if I'm smart as God, I'll be smarter than Adam. But she ate of the fruit, and she found out how stupid she was. And then, like a good little lady, she brings dinner to Adam, and dinner in the form of a fruit. It wasn't an apple. We don't know what type of fruit, but it was a fruit. So she brings, like a good lady, the fruit to Adam, and she says, eat. Now, Adam is looking at the most beautiful woman on the face of the earth, the only woman at that time on earth, but absolutely beautiful, absolutely uh, tremendous. Pamela Anderson pales in comparison. She is gorgeous. And Adam has a choice. Do I go with the uh, little beautiful lady or do I go with God? Well, hands down, the lady won. So he ate of the fruit. And that's a problem, too, in our, as by way of application, in our spiritual life. We can get distracted. Let's say uh, you meet a beautiful young lady, doesn't care anything about the Word, uh, the Word of God or anything, and you uh, get sucked in with her, and she can be a distraction to you, and vice versa. Uh, a young lady can fall in love with a man, and if he has no integrity in the form of having a spiritual life. Now, I know nowadays everybody likes to look at people in the form of uh, how they look. Wow, isn't he cute? And they uh, laugh and giggle over the, the poor young fellow who uh, doesn't know a thing about the Word of God or anything. And then um, that's called every uh, young lady goes to that stage, boy crazy. So they go boy crazy after all these other boys, and that's what they are, boys. <clears throat> and they have uh, probably no integrity. But once you get older, what you want to look for is not to be boy crazy. What you want to look for is somebody who has doctrine in their souls, and therefore you won't be led astray as Adam was led astray, and so he chose the woman and ate of the fruit, thus the first sin. Now Adam's sin was a sin of cognizance, and this is where we divide up the two categories of sins. Adam committed a sin of cognizance because he knew what he was doing. Eve did not know what she was doing. The Bible says she was utterly deceived. Sin of cognition. That means Adam knew what he is doing. And then Eve committed a sin of ignorance. And why was she ignorant? Because she wasn't listening in Bible class, that's why. But she was still ignorant of the fact. She thought death lied in the property of the tree, it didn't. Death lied in the fact of the utilization of her own, her very own volition. Therefore, uh, she, out of ignorance, was utterly deceived and ate. Now Adam knew it was wrong and he took it, yet they were both culpable. Both of them were immediately spiritually dead. And in the Bible it says, dying they shall die. The word muth in the Hebrew is used twice. That means there is a spiritual death immediately and that was eventually followed by a physical death and some hundreds and hundreds of years later, being that they were perfect and they had perfect health in the beginning, it took hundreds and hundreds of years for them to die off, plus the world had to be populated and other things that are not part of the subject. So therefore, uh, just know that Adam committed the sin of cognition, and that's why the sin nature it comes through Adam. That's why, uh, and that thus, the virgin birth. Why was there a virgin birth? Because the sin nature was not imputed to our Lord Jesus Christ. The virgin birth wasn't because... I, one time I asked somebody, uh, they were talking, they were Catholic, and I uh, said, well, well, what about the virgin birth? Why the virgin birth? And they said, well, because she was a virgin and she was holy. Well, that's stupid. It's because the old sin nature is passed down through the man, and since the man was not involved... The scripture says, uh, Jesus Christ conceived by the Holy Spirit. Since the man was not involved, therefore, the, uh, Jesus Christ was born without a sin nature. And he was born just as Adam was created, perfect. Adam was perfect, Jesus is perfect. Therefore, in Adam all die, in Christ shall all be made alive. So I hope you're starting to put all of this together. So because of the sin of cognition, the sin nature is passed down through the man, and the sin of ignorance was committed by the woman, and she was culpable, 
but the sin nature is not passed down through the woman because it was a sin of ignorance. So there's a difference in the two, yet both are sin and you are culpable for it. So God did not create, and this was point four, God did not create Adam or the woman with an old sin nature. They acquired it through their negative volition. What's negative volition? Well, God said, don't eat of the fruit, and they said, yes, we will. So they said, no, God, I'm not listening to you, and they did it. And that's their first act of rebellion. <clears throat> you see, uh, Adam and Eve, they did not need an active conscience in the garden, and there was only one sin that they could commit, which is rejection of the will of God. When the original sin of mankind occurred, the justice of God created an invisible barrier between God and man. In other words, we're imperfect, God is perfect. Imperfect beings can have no relationship with God, therefore Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for us so that we might have a perfect relationship. Justice creates the barrier because the justice of God is now the point of reference. Remember, it was the love of God as the point of reference in the garden, but after they sinned, it was justice. That means the justice of God had to judge those sins. And he bypassed Adam and Eve and simply judged Jesus Christ on the cross. And Adam and Eve, therefore, did believe in Jesus Christ later on, and they are in heaven today. And how do I know that? Because that's found in Scripture. The first thing they did was they put on some clothes. That means they were trying to adjust to each other. They thought that if they adjusted to each other, they could adjust to God. So they put on some clothes, both of them. And they looked at each other and said, we are alike and we are ashamed and now we put on our clothes and now we're alike, we must be in fellowship with God. But that was not the case. And later on, you will see in Genesis that they were clothed uh, with uh, the sheep skin and that is analogous to the fact that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ would be the sheep for us who would go to slaughter for us. And that's an indication that Adam and Eve believed in Jesus Christ and were covered uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ in that case. So the sovereignty of God and the free will of man are coexistent on the earth and come together at the cross. What's that mean, coexistent? The sovereignty, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, they coexist. Now the sovereignty of God, God knew everything in eternity past. That deals with omniscience. But sovereign means he's self-governing. God is self-governing. And in fact, we are self-governing in the fact that we have a free will and they coexist. That means at the same time, God has his sovereignty and we have ours coexisting at the same time. And that means that, uh, and this comes together at the cross. So there's a problem here in the fact that we committed, or Adam committed sin and then Adam all die, therefore we committed sin. So there's a problem in that and therefore the solution is Jesus Christ dying as a substitute on the cross. So we've noted that the issue of sin is, for the unbeliever, the issue of sin is simply to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in Christ, then the sin is the sin of rejection, and that is the only issue for the unbeliever. And for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the issue is 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So let's take a look at the New Testament categories of sin. Now this is where we're going to get into a delineation of the actual sins that are listed in the Bible. And we have Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Open your Bibles to Colossians 3, 5 through 10. It says, Therefore begin to put to death the members of your earthly body. What is the members of your body? Well, we noted that in the body is the old sin nature. This means... Put to death the old sin nature. And then it goes on with a listing of the categories of sin. And it has, is that Colossians 3, 5 through 10, is that right? And then it has immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked. When you were living in them, that means living in the old sin nature, in the members of your body. The old sin nature in the Greek is called sarx, which means flesh. In fact, the old sin nature is in our flesh. And this is telling us to put it to death. And how do you do that? First John 
1, 9. But now you also put these all aside, and here's a listing of some sins. Anger. Anger is a sin. A lot of people get anger, angry and they don't even know that they're sinning. Anger is a sin. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. That does not mean cuss words. We'll get into what this means in a little bit. An abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. What's the old self? That's the old sin nature. How do you lay it aside? First John 1, 9, and then follow up with Operation Z. What's Operation Z? Your cognition and metabolization of Bible doctrine. Therefore, what you learn in here is what you follow up with, and that's how you put aside the evil practices. You learn how not to do it, in fact, and have put on the new self. What's the new self? That's your spiritual life. First John 1, 9, you're filled with God and the Holy Spirit, and therefore you have a spiritual life to live. And then it continues, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So verse 5, begin to put to the death the members of your body is a reference uh, to rebound, and the members of the body is a reference to the old sin nature. And then we have a listing of sins, and of course, the New Testament is written in the Greek, and therefore I'm going to give you all of the Greek listing of these sins. And I'm just going to transliterate it. I'm not going to write it out in Greek. There would be really no point to it. So there's pornea, and that's P. Oh, that light's bright. R N E I A. Now, pornea. Now that sounds familiar. It sounds like pornography. Well, this means fornication, and that is unnatural sexual vices or any illicit sexual intercourse. So this is referring to sex outside of marriage. And that refers to fornication, adultery, and also the degenerate sins of homosexuality and lesbianism and those types of things. And Christians do commit those sins. Don't think that for a minute they do not. They do. And that, therefore we have rebound. So we have pornea, which means fornication. Now I'm not going to look at that bright thing anymore or I'll lose my eyesight. So what I'm going to do is just give you the spelling. The next uh, Greek word is Akatharsia, and that's spelled A-K-A-T-H-A-R-S-I-A. -A -A. Now this means impurity of mind. And what is this referring to? It's referring to mental adultery. You might not know that in your mind you can actually commit mental adultery or mental fornication, anything in your mind uh, with lust, and therefore that is a sin. Therefore, masturbation is a sin, and a lot of people don't know that when I bring that up. But it's a fact. It is a sin, and you name it the same way you do uh, any other sin. Then we have pathos. That's P-A-T-H-O-S. Pathos, P-A-T-H-O-S. And this is a degenerate passion. Now, what is degenerate? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were degenerates. And therefore, you say somebody is a sodomite. What's that mean? Homosexual. Uh, a man homosexual. Sodomite. And uh, so we see pathos, degenerate passions. And that also applies to female degenerate passion, female for female. And that's found in Romans. And we'll get to that later. And then we have the Greek word epithumia. Epithumia. That's E-P-I-T-H-U-M-I-A. Epithumia, and this means evil lust or desires. Then we have plonesia, and that's P-L-E-O-N-E-Z-I-A, P-L-E-O-N-E-Z-I-A, and this means having the will to have more, or an, an inordinate, inordinate means excessive, lust or desire. In other words, if you uh, walk around unhappy all the time because you don't have a bigger house, or you don't have all the money that you want and you are unhappy about this, well, you have an inordinate or excessive desire, and that is sin, believe it or not. So we continue with orge, that's O-R-G-E. All of this is found in Colossians 3, 5 through 10 from the Greek. Orge, O-R-G-E, this means anger, 
and generally anger is caused by jealousy. Some of the, some of the fiercest arguments have uh, been born out of jealousy, and that deals with anger, and anger is a sin, and I'm shocked uh, by how many people do not know that when you get angry, you are actually sinning. And you say, well, what about the Lord Jesus Christ and the money changers when he went through there and tipped them all over? That was righteous indignation. That doesn't mean when you get angry, you can justify it and say, I'm righteously indignant. Well, no. In your case, you're angry. <laughs> so, orge means anger. And then we have thumos, T-H-U-M-O-S. And thumos means emotions and turbulence and tantrums. In other words, you throw a hissy fit because you don't get your way. Uh, that's what little children do. If they don't get the little toy truck that they want, they throw a hissy fit. Well, this is thumos. And even adults can do this, <coughs> except adults do it differently. They go to a bar and cry in their beer or something like that. So it's emotions and turbulence and in tantrums. Then we have kakia. That's K A. K-I-A, and that means depravity, and that's evil directed towards someone. In other words, you hate somebody, uh, you look at somebody, you dislike them, you might not say it's hate, you say it's dislike, I really dislike <coughs> this person, and so you direct evil toward them, you try to snare them in something, and that is what kakia is. And then we have blasphemia, and that is simple enough, <coughs> excuse me, B-L-A-S-P-H-E-M-I-A and this means to malign or slander the very character of God. In other words, blasphemy. So that is to malign or slander the character of God and you see a lot of people doing that on the comedy channel. Ha ha funny. And then we have Oscrologia and that's A-I-S-C-H-R-O-L-O-G-I-A a-I-S-C-H-R-O-L-O-G-I-A. And this means deformed or ugly speech. That is talk that hurts others. That is, of course, gossiping, maligning, and judging of others. And the Bible considers that deformed and ugly speech. And a lot of people are involved, on, involved in that. And such speech, if you're a believer in... If you're a believer growing in grace, you're eventually going to get to a point where there's going to be a lot of iscrolegia that's uh, going to come towards you, which is ugly speech. And that's because there is a cosmic system, and you don't know these terms yet, but we'll get to them. And in the cosmic system, these people uh, reside, and they don't understand the divine dinosphere, and we haven't studied that, but we will. But just know that if you are filled with God the Holy Spirit, you are in the divine dinosphere and therefore you're growing in grace. And you will, at some point, receive a lot of testing from those who are in the cosmic system, and that's the way it is. So when ugly or deformed speech comes your way, do you react? You shouldn't. You should leave it in the hands of the Lord and go on your way and let them talk. They will be the ones who receive the punishment. Now let's look at Proverbs 6, 12 through 19. And this teaches two categories of sin. Proverbs 6, 12 through 19. Verses 12 through 15 of Proverbs 6 address the troublemaker. The troublemaker is arrogant. The troublemaker is jealous. The troublemaker is implacable. And he has revenge motivation, which is evil. He is a gossip, and he is guilty. He has inordinate ambition. Inordinate, as I said, means excessive. Excessive ambition and excessive competition. And we noted that in the Acts some weeks ago. And you probably don't remember, but it's on tape and you might want to listen to it again because uh, sometimes you pick up different things the more times you listen to it. I've listened to some of the Colonel's tapes uh, two and three times. I get something out of it every single time I rehear the tape. So if you remember Ananias and Sapphira, you remember that they were evil in the church and they had inordinate ambition. They wanted to be the ones who got all the glory in the church, so they lied to the Holy Spirit and dropped dead. And that's what happened. The troublemaker is a disaster in a local church or any organization. That means the gossip. 
any type of gossip maligning, if they start, if anyone starts gossiping about you, or if anyone starts gossiping about the pastor or anyone else, this becomes a disaster to any local church or organization, and it happens in the workplace all the time, and about half the time people are spent gossiping when they should be working, and so there's problems there as well. So it can be a disastrous thing, and that's part of the Proverbs that we've been studying. Troublemakers are uptight. That's something you need to understand about troublemakers. They're uptight, and that's because in their own mind, they're better than anyone else. They think they're better than you. Uh, in some cases, they think they're more holy than you, and therefore they are troublemakers, and all they do is tear you down to try to build themselves up. But what happens is if they live out their life doing this, they end up, as First John one five states, not one five, first John chapter five, which talks about the sin face to face with death, and gossips who continuously gossip and never rebound and therefore live out their days under the filling, under not the filling, but under the control of the old sin nature, they will die the sin face to face with death. And communist countries, by the way, in China their whole system is based on gossip. That how does the government keep such control of their people? Because uh, if they, for example, in China, if uh, they were to meet in a house such as this, and they do it anyway, but if they were to meet in a house such as this, the next door neighbor would peer through the window and say, I believe they're having a church service. And then they would call the authorities and gossip. So communism itself is based on gossip, which makes it extraordinarily evil. And therefore, we live in a country where we have the privacy and the privilege to meet, and that's a wonderful thing, and we should thank God for it, because not everybody in the world has that privilege. And a, a lot of uh, people in China who have believed in Christ have actually are actually sitting in jail today or have been martyred. So we have it made here. And so to come here and listen to the Word of God is a privilege for it is actually a privilege, and they see it as a privilege over there. We should see it as a privilege here as believers, and we should take every opportunity to learn the Word of God. Therefore, I'll be seeing you Tuesday night. Verse 12, a worthless person, an evil man, is one who walks with a false mouth. Verse 12 says, a worthless person, an evil man, is one who walks with a false mouth. This means that the troublemaking is generated by the mouth. And what can you do with the mouth? Gossip, malign, and judge. And a false mouth emphasizes the sins of the tongue. And in fact, there's, that's a whole category in itself that we will be studying uh, probably Tuesday. We will be studying the sins of the tongue. And then we'll move on to other sins because there are a lot of them, believe it or not. Verse 13 teaches that a troublemaker has body language. Now, this is what it says. He winks with his eye, he signals with his feet, and he points with his finger. You know, uh, I guess the best way to explain this is uh, when you make fun of somebody, pantomime, uh, like uh, maybe some girl is real flighty and uh, she's like, blah, 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 blah. So you pantomime and go, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's a part of sin because you're making fun of that person. And uh, in that, you're being rude and you're pointing the finger. Pointing the finger shows rudeness. You know, you're not supposed to point. Not unless you're trying to make a point. I might point someday. I don't know. But you're not supposed to, <coughs> for example, oh, look at that person. Look what she's wearing. Well, it's none of your business what people wear. And uh, just uh, stick with your own spiritual life. So this is showing rudeness uh, to the point of pointing a finger. And this is a body language of mockery, ridicule, or derision. And a troublemaker gets his kick by putting other people down. And why is that? Because he's building himself up. By putting someone else down, he's raising himself above, above well, he thinks he is, but he's not, because God will smack him down eventually. Verse 14, perversity in the right lobe devises evil continually. And, and a better translation would be, malice is in his right lobe, he devises evil at all times. He spreads strife. Perversity is deviation from Bible doctrine. The troublemaker does not go by what the Bible says is right and wrong, and uh, some believers evangelize, therefore, yet some believers, actually most believers today, spread strife. Wouldn't it be better to evangelize? Yes, it would. 
and evangelize, that means by, uh, oftentimes that means by your manner of life. If somebody sees you're never a gossip or maligner and they see you have a content and happy life, I've actually had uh, one person, I don't know if he's still on Bible tapes, but he got on Bible tapes because I was at work and he came up to me one day, and I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you a fact. And he came up to me at work one day and he said, uh, I've noticed how calm you are at work. And how do you do that? And I said, well, it's from these tapes right here. I listen to these. And he said, well, man, let me listen to them. And I said, sure, you can get all you want. I actually gave him a few boxes and he started ordering on his own. And then eventually both him and his wife were listening and then he went on to something else. I don't know where he is. We didn't keep in touch but he could very well still be listening to those tapes. And that is um, how you can evangelize, actually, by the manner of your life. And if you're one to gossip all the time and malign all the time, and if you're one to do that, you have lost your testimony. You have no testimony to those around you. So therefore, verse 15, Therefore his destruction will come suddenly. Now that's divine discipline. He might seem to be going along fine, and then suddenly his destruction comes. Maybe he dies of a heart attack, however, car accident. But it comes suddenly from God, and he will be broken instantly, and there is no remedy. And there's no remedy because he chooses not to have a remedy. If there is a remedy, it's First John 1, 9, but he chooses not to have the remedy. In other words, he's been working off human solutions his whole life, and there is no solution in the human solution. And nobody can put Humpty Dumpty back together again, in other words. And then we see verses 16 through 19, which list the seven worst sins in God's eyes. And I made reference to this about three or four weeks ago, and that was Proverbs. And this is Proverbs, and we're looking at uh, verses 16 through 19, except last time I thought I told you it was uh, chapter 7 and I was wrong. But you don't remember that anyway. So verses 16 through 19 list the seven worst sins in God's eyes. Verse 16, There are six things which the Lord hates, in fact seven, and are an abomination to his soul. And of course we've studied anthropopathism, which means that uh, God has a human characteristic. He doesn't have it, but he's naming a human characteristic so that we can understand. And hatred describes the policy of God in terms of his human modus operandi so that we can understand it. Verse 17, and there, here we start to have a listing of those seven worst sins. Verse 17, he has a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. So point one, a proud look is simply arrogance. Arrogance is one of the top seven worst sins. And that includes uh, pretty much everything, including bitterness, jealousy, vindictiveness, implacability, hatred, or self-pity. Point two, a lying tongue refers to malicious gossip or slander. Malicious gossip or slander. If people slander you, well, they have a lying tongue. Part of the worst seven sins. Worse than... Fornication. Notice fornication is not listed. It is worse than fornication. And that should uh, make you uh, clamp down on your tongue every time you want to say something about somebody. And you should because there is great punishment that comes along with these things. Point three, hands that shed innocent blood. Now this is the only overt sin mentioned as being the worst of the top seven sins and that is murder. The only overt one listed, and that's interesting. And uh, murder oftentimes is a result of the others, which is jealousy and all that. Somebody uh, comes home, sees his wife in bed with somebody else, he kills them both. Well, that's, uh, it's, still, it's murder, and he does it out of jealousy, and it's still wrong. And in fact, in the Old Testament, one of the most interesting things I found in the Old Testament, and I found it about two years ago, is the fact that when a woman commits adultery, on her husband and in the Old Testament they of course did the sacrifices and who has to do the sacrifice the woman commits adultery on the man who is the one commanded to do the sacrifice the man and he didn't even do anything but yes he has he immediately becomes jealous and it's a natural reaction of the sin nature being members of our body and therefore he becomes jealous and he will become jealous and since God knows that, he immediately says, Man, go make a sacrifice to me for your jealousy. Nothing is said about the woman. 
It's very interesting. All right, verse uh, 17, when we just noted a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and we noted murder in that case. And point four, we see a pattern in verse 17, for it lists three categories of sin. It lists mental attitude sins, it lists sins of the tongue, and it lists that overt sin. So there's three categories, the mental attitude sins, those, what are mental attitude sins? You hate someone in your mind. That's a mental attitude sin. And there is no peace in that. If you're running around with hate for somebody or jealousy, you can't live a peaceful life that way. And that's part of uh, the law of volitional responsibility. You're already miserable. And then God hands you down with some more discipline to make you rebound and get out of this. So the pattern is mental attitude sins. Uh, sins of the tongue and overt sins and murder, as I said, is the only sin listed as uh, the uh, only overt sin listed. In verse 18, and we'll wrap it up here shortly, verse 18, a right lobe that devises evil conspiracies and feet that run rapidly to evil. Now this is talking about frustrated people and they become conspiratorial. And oftentimes in churches, excuse me, there is uh, conspiracies to do away with the authority of the pastor or what be, and there are a lot of conspiracies that come out of this, and there's conspiracies against the president, and this is part of it. When authority makes them feel uncomfortable, they do everything they can to undermine authority, and this is a big problem in our country today. Uh, children not obeying their parents is a, a terrible problem, and these young people are going up to be monsters, and I, I really dread to see what's going to happen in the future to our country unless they turn around and get with the Word of God and we all hope and pray that occurs but of course that has to do with volition and that's going to be up to them to make that choice so as a result of conspiracy there is active civil disobedience when you see somebody uh, standing in front of a abortion clinic with those signs that is civil disobedience Furthermore, that is Christian activism, and that is not the Christian way of life. You're trying to whitewash the devil's world. Yes, there are problems in the devil's world. There always will be. Live your own spiritual life. Stop messing with people. That's not evangelizing. Some uh, young lady's having a problem, and she wants to go have an abortion, and somebody goes up today and says, You are a murderer. That's not evangelism. You can go up to the young lady and say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's evangelism. So to do that, that's not the good news. The scripture tells us to give the good news. Don't go around giving bad news. Oh, you're a terrible murderer. That's disgusting. And that's part of activism. And this is part of the seven worst sins that are listed here. Verse 19, a false witness who utters lies, who sows discord, which means strife, between the brethren, brethren being believers. And, you know, people say, hey, brother, hey, sister. That just means that uh, they are in the same family, and we are royal family of God. So, uh, and the Jews had the uh, greatest system of jurisprudence in history, and this was written at the time of Solomon. Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs. And, uh, therefore, this was written at a time when the uh, Jews had the greatest jurisprudence prudence in history and that uh, that false witness is talking about perjury and perjury if you perjure yourself under law that's part of the worst seven sins and we've had some people in high power before commit these types of things and they get away with it because the rule of law in this country has broken down on occasion hopefully it can be restored therefore um, I guess it's time to wrap it up now and I have, I have some more, but I'll just save this for uh, Tuesday, 7 o'clock. I'll be here. If you're not, oh well, I'll be here. So therefore, uh, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to study your word. May this knowledge that has been imparted to us, this concerning sin, be a source of blessing and challenge to us a challenge for us to recognize that when we are about to gossip or commit the sins that have been uh, sort of hidden from Christendom, that uh, we understand that they are sin and we understand that we have been given a wonderful and simple solution so that we might live the unique spiritual life. 
thank you, Father, for this opportunity this morning. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.